how to share the virtue of chastity with other people. Now, I'm very blessed, okay, in my role here at, 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 at Fire Up Ministries and as a chastity speaker, I get to speak to thousands of people every year about this virtue, okay? And normally, the people I'm talking to, to some degree, want to hear what I have to say, amen? Which makes my job a lot easier in sharing chastity with other people. I have enormous respect, though, for the average person who is out there in the workplace, at school, at university, and you're encountering people and you know the Lord is putting it on your heart. I want to share the, the I want to share chastity with this person. Or maybe you've got a family member or a friend or someone that you really love and care for, but you know that they're that, that they're not living a chaste life. You can sense and see the emptiness, the pain, the misery, the struggle that they're in, right? The uncertainty that they're in, and you so desperately want to share chastity with them, but you don't know how. How do we do it? I've got a couple of simple thoughts for you that I think are really going to help. The number one thing that we've got to knock down straight away is this. The enemy, Satan, is going to want to convince you that because you are not perfectly pure, you have no right to evangelize other people in this area. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. That is not true. Okay, I've got, I've got, I've got news for you. Okay, if... If in order to be a chastity speaker even, in order to run a Catholic ministry and proclaim this truth, the founder had to be perfectly pure, well, guess what? Fire up would definitely not exist. Amen? Because like you, I have my own struggles with sexuality. I have to be on guard. I have to fight and pray and fast and work and pray and all those things at, at continuing to grow in the virtue of chastity every single day. Amen? And so when I, first, when I gave my first chastity talk, I was still struggling with pornography. I was still struggling with masturbation. I was not perfectly pure by any means, amen? But when I got up to speak, I was honest with the audience and I said, look, look, now I had, I had experienced some level of freedom at this point, but I was still you know, falling quite regularly. I was like, look, I was like, I'm not, I haven't got this down pat. I, I'm not totally free from this. But all I'm going to say is that I know the emptiness and the misery that comes after I fall. And I also know the joy and the bliss and the happiness that comes from living a chaste life for that period of a week or two weeks where I haven't watched anything. There is so much joy and freedom and happiness in that. And I just want to share that with you. Amen. So whenever we're sharing chastity, it's important to be vulnerable and to be honest and to not pretend we're holier than we are. To be upfront with people and say, look, you know, I haven't got this perfectly down pat, but all I can say is from the times that I have lived it well, in the moments when I am living it well, life is so much better. My relationship with God is better. My, my relationship with my family, my friends, my girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, husband is so much better. And when I do fall in purity, when I don't live chastity well, I see how it affects every relationship. It affects my happiness. It makes me feel empty and miserable. And so speak from that place, okay? The enemy does not want you to speak about it. So he's going to convince you you've got no right to do it. Don't listen to him. Amen? None of us are perfectly pure, but we all have, to, but we have, we have an obligation to evangelize Jesus. And part of Jesus's message is living a chaste life. Amen? So let's jump in now to two really important things that every person needs to do and to be to be an effective evangelist for chastity, how to share chastity with other people. First of all is we need to be cheerful witnesses to the virtue of chastity. Amen. So what does this mean? It means that there is so much power. Okay. There is so much power in the witness of a person who is not living purity perfectly, because none of us do, but from the witness of someone who is striving every day to be pure and chaste. People will look at you. They may not even know why you're glowing. They may not even know why you have such an authentic smile or you're so joyful and happy or that the way that you treat them is so much more respectful than everybody else or so much more, they feel honored and cherished by you. You, 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 they're not in a romantic relationship with you, but it's like this guy or this woman, whenever I encounter them, they just have such a joy and a love. It's so sincere. 
They have this wow factor every time I encounter them. Amen. That is what we are all called to be. And I would argue that chastity, living purity, being able to truly see God in the other person, okay, knowing how to order every sexual desire or urge in, in, to, 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 to its right proper place, to just simply love every person in whatever context that might be, amen, that having that purity of heart, that purity of eyes and mind, that is what makes people feel loved by you deeply because they can see they're not just looking at me this way or they're not using me they sincerely love me they see me amen so we've got to be cheerful witnesses to chastity because people notice it and they want it they want to find out what's different about this guy what's different about this girl why why do they look at me differently or treat me differently it's because we're striving to live purity. If you want to be a great witness to chastity, if you want to be a great teacher of chastity, and by the way, being a great teacher of chastity could simply just be by the witness that you're showing, amen? But being a great teacher of chastity also means that you must commit to being a lifelong student of chastity as well, okay? I might be a full-time teacher on chastity, but I can guarantee you I spend a lot more time studying chastity than teaching chastity. Amen? I've got my head in books every day. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm praying over the scriptures that might relate to it. I'm, I'm reading the theology of the body, right? I'm reading the saints. I'm listening to YouTube videos. Or I'm learning and I'm immersing myself in in this content because you will only you will you will be as good a teacher of something as you are a student of it okay the more you learn the more humble you are in acknowledging i don't know everything there is to know about this virtue i need to grow in it i need to expand and i need to be purified and purged and continue to expand here if you have that attitude to chastity in always wanting to grow and deepen and to receive even more healing in this area you will be a much more effective teacher of it. Amen? Because the best teachers I know are the ones that are deeply passionate about whatever they're teaching, right? We all had teachers at school, right? Who, you know, you can tell from the teacher that is madly in love with their subject and the one that is teaching because it's a good job. Amen? So in the same way, we can't simply be like uh, Catholics that are just speaking about chastity from just from a place of, it's so hard, it's such a struggle, but you know, we're meant to live this way. Amen. That's not going to rub off on anybody. We've got to live it. We've got to, str- we've got to struggle in it. We've got to strive to grow in it more and more and more. And the more we begin living chastity, the more joyful we'll be about the virtue and the more passionate we're going to be to want to share it with other people. And when you meet someone who's fired up for chastity, who loves it and he's living it, That is the most effective evangelist and teacher you could possibly have. So this is important too. It is very important to grow in your formation in chastity. It is important to have good answers. But I would argue even the best answers, if they're given by someone that is not madly in love with the answer, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, not gonna go over half as well as if the person maybe was, you know, struggling a little bit to convey the best answer possible, but was madly in love with the virtue they were they were preaching about. People don't always have to believe they don't have to believe everything that you say. Amen. But what they do need to believe is that you believe in what you're saying. So Four really quick ways for us personally to grow in the virtue of chastity, which are going to make us more more effective evangelists and teachers of purity. The first one is prayer, okay? Every single one of us struggles with lust, all of us. Not a single person doesn't battle with lust in some way. And so I'm a big, I, I really encourage people to make time every day for vulnerable heart prayer with God, okay? where we walk in to the church, the chapel, or whatever our sacred space is, wherever you pray, and just simply say, Lord Jesus, you know what? I experience some sexual urges and desires which are not always rightly ordered. Sometimes my sexual desire can can become a temptation to lust. So Lord, I desperately need a savior. I need you to step in. I need you to heal it. 
And when we pray that prayer, something beautiful and powerful happens. Jesus gives us the grace of redemption of our sexual desires and urges. So we will slowly, over time, truly, and I'm, and I, I can speak from experience here. I have lived this, and I am living this. That we can honestly, we don't need to live life simply trying to resist every sexual temptation. God, Jesus came to provide the grace of of redemption of desire where we could truly experience a transformation of our sexuality so much so that we don't even desire to use somebody. Amen. But we've got it. But the only way we're ever going to get there is if we're humble enough to admit I am broken. I am wounded and I need Jesus to step in and heal me. The second thing is this, is that we've got to make use of the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist at Mass and confession. Confession is the sacrament for the spiritually dead. The Holy Eucharist is the sacrament for the spiritually alive. Amen. So if you're you're in the state of grace, okay, if you're in the state of grace, go to Holy Mass as often as you possibly can. I, I tell people, okay, Absolutely, we should go be going every single Sunday. But honestly, if you are able to attend Mass a couple of extra times every week, go, right? Jesus Christ is waiting for you at the altar. If you believe he's there, go. It's half an hour a day. Go and go and receive our Lord. If you can go to Mass every day, go to Mass every day. My life changed when I began to go to Mass every single day. Amen. So if you're in a state of grace, go to Mass as often as you possibly can. And even if you have no mortal sins to confess, I would still encourage you to go to confession at least every month, but I would even encourage more frequently. If you can go weekly or fortnightly, I would encourage you to do that as well. However, if you do, and we do at times, if we fall, if we fall into a grave sexual sin, okay, Go to confession as soon as possible out of honor and out of reverence for the fact that Jesus truly is present in the Holy Eucharist, okay? If we have fallen into a grave sexual sin, we should not receive our Lord in Holy Communion until we have first confessed our sin in the sacrament of confession, okay? Then we, once we're filled with grace again, we can go and receive Holy Communion again. So I see a lot of people, this is where they they lose this battle. They start falling into sexual sin like masturbation or pornography and they start getting embarrassed to not receive Holy Communion. So they stop going to Mass, right? But really, we should never give up the fight. Keep going to confession and then keep going back to Mass and don't ever give up that cycle. Amen? Thirdly is fasting. Okay, although I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm, you know, like I'm a, I'm, 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 I'm huge in trying to present the idea that we truly can receive a, 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 a powerful re- redemption of our sexual desires to the point where we will not even desire to lust anywhere near as often. The truth is, no matter how, how, how redeemed you are, you are going to experience moments, temptations w- will catch you out and you will need to have self-mastery. And you may actually be tempted to do something that you're not supposed to do, and you may need to be like, you know what? I've got to practice some self-discipline and self-mastery over this disordered passion right now, and I need to resist it. Fasting is what helps us conquer those very difficult moments, okay? So choose something, a food that you really like, or you might have certain days in the week where you have cold showers or you abstain from soft drink, not just during Lent, but you, you, you know, pick different things where you can fast from foods or drinks uh, or, or social media or things that you like, music, etc., to build self-mastery. Because if you can say no to an extra slice of pizza, you're a lot more likely to say no to a temptation to watch porn. And lastly, fourthly, is of course, get formed, okay? Because the more formation we have, the formation, okay, can't simply... So the goal of formation is transformation. If we only get formed in our mind, that's never enough, okay? Head knowledge isn't going to help you become more pure, okay? Head knowledge, the goal of the head knowledge is that you would pray with that 
sit with that and it would begin to transform your heart as well. Amen? That's the first thing. So being a cheerful witness of chastity. Lastly, how do we actually, now that we're striving to live it better, how do we actually help somebody with it? I would say a few things. If you know somebody, for example, who has moved in with their girlfriend or boyfriend, we'll just use that as an example, but there's multiple things we could pick. But if you know somebody and you love somebody and you know they've moved in with their boyfriend or girlfriend, okay, they're sleeping together, for example, be, be, and they're not married yet, how do you approach it? A few things I would say that I know have worked for me and in many different, in many different cases, okay? The first thing is this. If you approach them and you just be like, hey, you know, by the way, I know that you're doing this, you know, you really need to stop and you start nagging them and nagging them about it, most likely they're going to put a wall up and they're going to shut you out and not want to talk to you about it, okay? Or they're going to, they're going to start to defend themselves and get angry and then just get, and, and that's not going to be very helpful. The goal here, okay, let's think about it. What is the goal? The goal can't simply be, well, I told them what the right thing to do was and they rejected it, that's their fault. The goal is you do want them to get to the point where they move out, amen? So we've got to think, it's not just about presenting the truth, it's about presenting the truth in a way that is actually going to move them to change. So how do we do this? The first thing is prayer needs to be at the beginning, middle, and end of every act of evangelization or sharing of chastity or our Catholic faith for that matter. Amen? So the first thing I always do is if there's somebody I know I want to speak to about something, I pray that the Holy Spirit would go before me and would begin shining lights in this person's heart and mind themselves that they would begin to be to get in touch with the pain, the emptiness, the misery, the frustration Okay, or even just the sense that I know I'm not doing the right thing, right? That the Lord would begin to shine lights on their sin in their own heart and mind. Okay, first, before I even speak to them about it. Secondly, I begin praying that the Lord also would begin, okay, to open their hearts so much so that they would actually be wanting or seeking advice or help or support, that they actually would begin to want to change. And now they may not know where to turn or who to talk to or what to do, and the enemy's gonna be creeping in there and, ah, oh, don't move out, it doesn't matter, or don't stop watching the porn, you're doing nothing wrong, right? But I always pray, Lord, begin to open their hearts, make them receptive to the truth, so that if a seed was sown, it would it would be it would be it would take root in good soil. Amen. Thirdly, I then pray, Lord, create a space for me to speak to them. Amen. Or it might not be me. I say create a space for somebody that you can move in the right direction, create this opportunity where someone will be able to encounter this person and speak to them about this, this particular topic, okay? And sometimes, right, I, I generally start, you know, sometimes I know a lot about people, um, you know, just through my line of work, okay? Sometimes I get, you know, I'll get, you know, a girl will come in and share what her boyfriend is struggling with or, the, or vice versa, and then I happen to be talking to this guy or this girl, and I know a lot about them that they don't even know I know about them, right? And so I can begin to say little things that I know I might know they're struggling with these things. They haven't actually come out and said it, but I might plant little seeds to see, are they ready to begin discussing it? Or are they ready to go down this road? And if they shut it down or don't respond to it or ignore it, then I leave it, keep praying. I might drop something else little, okay? But I'm very cautious not to come on too hard. Fourthly, I begin praying, I say, Lord, get them to open up first, okay? So when I go and give a talk somewhere, the best possible scenario is that somebody is so convicted by what they've heard, they come up to me and say, Simon, I need help. Please help me. What advice would you give? What do I do? If you've got someone who's come to you saying, I want help, they're gonna be a 100 times more willing to receive whatever you're gonna say, amen? So there have been times that I've been talking to someone, they haven't really grabbed onto what I'm saying, but after a while, they might text me or ring me or email me and say, Simon, can we meet up? I wanna to talk to you about something, right? 
And I love that because I'm like, okay, they're ready. The Lord has made them ready to receive the truth. Now, if I get in that situation where someone has said, what do you think I should do or how do I change? Guess what? We can definitely turn up in a sense how firm we can be about what the truth is. We still do it in love, but we don't have to beat, we don't, we don't have to be as cautious. We can just give them the truth that they have already asked to receive. The most important thing after that is don't continue to nag them and bug them and bother them and ring them and message them and say, you know, I know we had that good chat the other day, you know, what else can I do? Or have you moved out yet? Or, you know, have you put that filter on yet? Sometimes people in a moment of grace will be led to open up to you about something. But then when they leave, they sometimes think, oh, geez, maybe I opened up too much. I don't actually know if I'm comfortable with them knowing all that stuff now, but geez, I've said it and I can't do anything. If that person becomes, if you start coming on stronger and stronger and stronger after that, sometimes they completely shut down and they run away. Amen. And you've, and you've lost them for that, for, for that moment, or maybe you've lost them, right? So what I say, what I always do is I always then back that encounter up with a lot of prayer. And I say, Lord, Ultimately, the Holy Spirit is the one who converts. Amen. The Holy Spirit does all the converting. We, we only plant the seeds, which God gives us the grace to do anyway. And the Holy Spirit waters it and he nourishes it. If anything is going to bear fruit, it's all God's work. Okay. We play a very minor part anyway. So after you've planted some seeds, just pray and pray and pray that that person is go, that, that seed will take root will be nurtured in good soil and will grow and that they will ch- that they will make the change they need, that they need to make. Okay? But lastly, it's also important always be ready and be available for that person should they reach out again, okay? Or sometimes if I haven't heard from someone for a little while, I might just check in and see how they're going, but I definitely don't continue nagging, okay? Now sometimes and this is a, this is a very humbling thing to understand, Sometimes somebody might need 10 different encounters. A few of them might, might be with a person. There might be a podcast. There might be a book. It could be a, a, a you know, um, it could be a talk they go to. And all those things need to happen before that person makes a change. Amen. I remember when I heard Jason Evert the first time, I wasn't interested. Can, can you believe that? The first time I heard Jason Evert, I wasn't ready. He came back a couple of years later, I was ready. Amen. So sometimes people need a whole series of encounters before they make that change. Now, sometimes I've been blessed to be the last person in the chain and I've seen that change happen. Other times, maybe God's just used me right at the beginning or in the middle and I don't see the instant change. I might even see them push away from me and say, I don't agree with what you're saying. But that's not that. That shouldn't make us clam up and not try again. We're all just we're all working together. The whole church, everybody. We're all meant to be doing our little bit. Let's just be faithful to whoever God puts in front of us to say whatever we can say in the right way in the right time, and keep praying before, during, and after that this person will begin. Okay, to be so transformed by what we've said and what God is doing in their life that they will make that change. Amen. Anyway, I could say a lot more, but I'll leave it there. I hope that's helpful. God bless you all.